Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we turn now in our study of Dante's Inferno to the final cantos, 32, 33, 34. This is circle nine. Here we are at um, Cositis, the realm of the betrayers. And we're going to look at all three of these together because I think that's what Dante would want for us because I don't think we should break these up. I think it's, there's, there's too much that's happening here in these final three cantos for us to not see them as a unit, and so we will see them as a unit. Allow me, first of all, to congratulate you. You've made it to the very end of Inferno. That's a, been a long journey. Of course, we're going to qualify this as the end of our journey with Dante at the end of Inferno, but Dante the Pilgrim will go on to take the journey of Purgatorio and Paradiso, so that by the time the Commedia is over, we've done the exact same pretty much length of Inferno two more times. Now, if you haven't been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, I very much recommend that you hit that site, LearnStrong.net, find that AP folder, and make sure that you have at least worked with our, uh, our texts up to this point. The Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Assumption, for uh, our study is that you've been able to do that, as well as everything up through and including St. Augustine's Confessions. We, of course, have been giving guided lectures over all of the preceding 31 cantos, and for the last time now, let's just look back at where we've been. I think this is significant, as we finish our study together, that we want to look at the ways in which we've, we've covered a lot of ground with Dante the Pilgrim and Dante the Poet. Let's take a look one last time. At Canto 1, we are on the 7th of April, Thursday evening, 1300. Dante, him, the pilgrim, is 35 years old. Lost in a dark wood of error. We've got the leopard, the lion, the wolf there, and Virgil will show up. Canto 2, the invocation of the muse, and then Virgil tells Dante, Beatrice sent me. Dante says, all right, let's do this. And throughout the rest of Inferno, Dante, of course, is like, okay, I think I can do this. Oh, I'm not sure I can do this. Okay, I think I can do this. I'm not sure I can do this, right? Canto 3, the inscription of hell, abandoned hope all you who enter here, the uncommitted. And, of course, we will have then Ashram. And Canto 4, Limbo and the First Circle, the Unbaptized Pagans, Homer, Virgil, and of course Aristotle are all there. Cantos 5, 6, and 7 of the Incontinent, those who have the weak will, and Circle five, circle 2 of Canto 5, the Jack Lovers of Dido and Francesca. Underline that Francesca because the story of Francesca will come with the story of Ugolino uh, 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 as being the two remarkable bookends stories of the, uh, of the Inferno. We'll come back to it. Canto 6, we got Circle 3, the Gluttons with Chaco. Canto 7, we got Circle 4, the Prodigals and the Avaricious. And then Circle 5, Styx, the Wrathful, the Sullen. They can't talk very well. Canto 8, we have Felicius, the Styx, the Felipe Argente story. Canto 9, the Gates of Dis are open. Canto 10, the Conversation with Farinata and Cavalcante. Canto 11, as we pointed out when we did that one, and now that you're at the end, you can see the genius of Canto 11. We've got a topography for Virgil of the rest of hell telling Dante the Pilgrim. Canto 12 begins the violent, the circle, the, air, the area of the violent. Circle 7, round 1, or ring 1, uh, can, uh, Canto 12, uh, the minotaurs and the centaurs, the violent against neighbors and phalasia on the river of blood. Canto 13, circle 7, round 2, the violent against self. These are the suicides, right, and the talking trees. Canto 14, circle 7, ring 3, the violent against God, blasphemers, and Campanus is there, sacrificed on the ground, right? We also have the old man statue that's talked about, right? Canto 15 and 16, circle 7, ring 3, the violent against nature. These are our sodomites, right? Now, we said two things about this, didn't we? We said that there is, there, uh, according to Dante and the church of his day, um, any sex act that is not going to directly lead to procreative act to, and to children is an unnatural act, and therefore there's something fundamentally wrong with it. The other thing we would say is, along with Canto 16 and the three sodomites from Florence who circle Dante, is that without question, in Inferno, these two cantos will show Dante the poet showing his greatest level of generosity for anybody that's in, uh, that's in Inferno. You can make of that what you wish. Canto 17, Circle 7, Ring 3, the violin against art. These are the users. And uh, then they jump on uh, Jerrion's back and ride down into Circle 8. Canto 18 begins then the uh, simple fraud, as it's often referred to. And this is the Malaboge, right? The simple fraud, Bolgia 1, Pander seducers. Bolgia 2, the flatters. 
In life you speak poop, in the afterlife you eat poop, right? Canto 19, Circle 8, Bolsa 3, the Simoniacs with Pope Nicholas III, and of course, uh, no question, Boniface VIII, Dante the Reformer comes to town, and, and we gave a lecture on the significance and the courage that it took for Dante to play that game. Canto 20, Circle 8, Bolsa 4, the fortune tellers here, Tiresias and the rest of them, heads turned around, they're looking backwards, not forwards anymore, because they, uh, they are being punished for always wanting to see the future, right? And the tears run down their back and through the, the cleft of the buttocks is, is what we're told. Canto 21-22 we saw as a unit. Bolgia 5, this is the berators and the farting demons story. Canto 23, Circle 8, Bolgia 6, these are the hypocrites, they were those heavy robes. And Caiaphas, the betrayer of Christ, uh, will be crucified on the ground. Canto um, uh, 24 25, Circle 8, these are important lines for us in AP English. Bolgia 7, the thieves. We begin though with that famous up on your feet passage. Dante is tired. He's ready to be done. Some of you are echoing some of the same sentiments. And then finally we have those men who are turning into snakes and snakes turning into men. Thievery fundamentally changes who you are ontologically, epistemologically. And we'll say that Dante the philosopher is making that argument again and again. Cantos 26, uh, 27, circle 8, Bolgia 8. The false counselors here, of course, we have the famous last words of Ulysses. And then Guido telling us how Boniface VIII really did damn his soul. Um, Kentos, um, Kento 28, Circle 8, Bolgia 9. These are, the, uh, these are those who are always breaking things apart. The, um, the schema, uh, they're, they're, they're creating certain kinds of schisms, right? And so this, um, the schismatics is what this is called. Here, of course, tragically, we have Muhammad gutted. Uh, it's, it's brutal. And, and Mosca talking about, uh, with Mosca referencing the Guelph Ghibelline contest. We're going to see more about these Guelph Ghibellines here at the conclusions you would predict at the conclusion of Inferno. Canto 2930, Circle 8, Bolgia 10. Right, we're out of the we're out of circle eight by the end of this. The falsifiers, these are the alchemists, the counterfeiters, and even Sinon is there with his bloated belly, reminding us, of course, of the belly of the wooden horse, the Trojan horse, right? Canto 31 is that bridge, Canto. The ring of giants, Nimrod, right, and uh, Antaeus will lift them and bring them down to circle nine. And now we will turn to the last cantos of Inferno. Now, just to remind, the hope is, again, you're reading this stuff on your own. If you haven't been reading any of this on your own, you've just been listening to me, I really do challenge you. Pause and go and take a look at these three last cantos. See how much of this you can read on your own. Some of the most compelling stuff of all of Inferno, Dante will save for the very end. That famous uh, story. We'll get there. Our learning theory is to, again, try to relate new information to old information in meaningful ways. We do that in our learning theory by asking our three guiding questions. What does the text say? What does the text mean? How do I relate to this information in some meaningful way? Of course, we're going to ask that question at level two, B, about symbolism and irony. And we're also going to be paying attention to Dante as poet, philosopher, and, 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 and politician. And, and then we're going to be asking at level 3A, how can I relate this to other, to other texts we've studied in AP and obviously to myself at 3B? Let's work with a real quick overview of where we're headed, okay? Um, Cositus, the realm, is divided into four kinds of traitors. So let's do this really first, or really quickly. Uh, the first realm, um, Caino. Cain, right, is the origination of this one. Killed Abel, and therefore these are traitors of kin and family. Um, the second one, um, Antonino. Um, Antonia uh, is, is a traitor to country. Antonor is an interesting guy. In, in Iliad 3, 178, we have a reference to him there. And he's a good Trojan, but through the medieval period, he was the one attributed to betraying the great city of Troy to the Greeks. And for that, then he, this will be the area of traitors to country. The third is Ptolemia. And these are the betrayers of guests. In other words, violating what we called in our very early conversations in the Iliad, violating Xenia, that idea, that ghost, guest host relationship. Ptolemy um, jacked Simon and his two sons, and for that we will then have this, um, this area named. Finally, Judica, which is named after, of course, the betrayer of all masters, is Judas Iscariot, the betrayer um, there. And we will have here, in the center of hell, the parody of the Holy Trinity by having Lucifer, Satan, in ice, in the center. All of, all of um, Cositus is, is ice. And we'll have 
um, Satan with his three mouths, three faces, three mouths. Uh, the three mouths, we have a red mouth, the chewing of Judas, traitor, of course, to church. We have the black mouth Brutus and the yellow mouth um, Cassius, and these are, of course, traitors to empire. So as we now turn in our reading of this text, we will go uh, through these cantos now. We'll read, we'll enjoy um, the language starting at 32, and we're at Cositus now. We've just been set down by Antaeus, and so now Dante the pilgrim and Dante the poet will speak. If I had harsh and grating rhymes to befit that melancholy hole, which is the place all the other rocks converge and thrust their weight, then I could more completely press the juice from my conception. I wish I had words to tell you, he says, what it is that I saw in the center of hell in Cositis. But... Since I lack such lines, I feel afraid as I come to speak of this. It is not jokingly that one begins to describe the bottom of the universe, not a task suited for a tongue that whines mama and dada. In other words, I, I, can't, I can't use children's language to describe what I'm about to describe to you. May the muses, and we have another invocation of the muse here, may the muses help my verses when they helped Amphion wall Thebes. There's this famous notion that Amphion had this lyre and he played so beautifully that the rocks built themselves the walls, the famous walls of Thebes, so that word not diverge from fact as it takes its course. We're back again to the study and the consideration of language. All the way through, Dante the poet has been concerned with language, hasn't he? Oh, whore! beyond all others ill-begot, who dwell in that place so hard to speak about. Better for you to be born a sheep or a goat. Aeneas says this at the beginning of the Aeneid. Achilles has said it, of course, oh, no question. Odysseus said it many times, I wish I'd never been born here. In other words, these poor souls down here, it would have been better that they had been born sheep or goats. By the way, this is important. Write this in your notes. As we get into Cositis and the end of the Inferno, the bottom of Inferno, our actions down there, we'll see if these prisoners and these sinners are increasingly bestial. Put a note, you'll see what I'm saying. Sheep and goat are mentioned here, right? Of course, sheep and goat, of course, are the differentiations that are often made when that famous passage where Jesus Christ says at the final days of judgment, some will go as sheep, some will go as goats. Dante is in fine poetic form here, right? When we were deep in the darkness of the pit beneath the giant's feet, much further down, and I still gazed back up the high wall of it, watch how you step. That, this is Virgil now. Watch how you step, I heard a voice in tone. Be careful you do not set your feet on the weary, wretched brother's heads. Whereupon I turned and saw before me and underfoot a lake that ice made less like water than glass, a sea of ice. In Austria, never has the Danube set, uh, the Danube set so thick a veil about its current as this, nor under its cold sky has the far-off dawn had Mount Tamarnik fallen to strike that ice, or Paraphonina uh, in the Alps. It would not even then creak, even at its edge. Uh, these are mountain references, and in other words, it's cold and it's icy. And then we get another frog reference. As the frog lies, snout above water to croak in the season, when the peasant woman often has reveries of gleaning spirits, livid to where the cheeks turn color with shame, were locked inside the ice, teeth, chattering, the note of a stork's beak makes. Now, th 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 this is compelling stuff. Buried in ice up to your neck for eternity, the sound, the note a stork's beak makes, the kind of chattering, constant teeth chattering. Robert Frost Palm, some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. This fire and ice, is, this is, uh, of course, a big part of where it comes from. That phrase, not till hell freezes over, yeah, this is a Dante line as well. In the center of hell, we don't have any fire, we have ice, and they're buried in it, up to their necks in it, teeth chattering. Each held his face turned down. They testified cold by their mouths, and misery by the looks their eyes bore. After a time, while I surveyed the scene around me, I glanced down at my feet and saw two shades there packed in head to head, so tightly that their hair was internet. Now we're going to have a couple of brothers here, Alessandro and Neapolitan uh, Albertini, they're brothers, and in 1285, they, they killed each other, right? Oh, you whose breasts are pressed together, I said. Who are you? They bent back their necks at that, and having raised their faces to me, they shed tears 
welling now from eyes almost already moist to flow down over their lips, where the frost glued each to the other, ever more tightly fused. Iron clamps never held beam to beam so fast, and like two goats, each butted the one he faced in a helpless rage. So you get the two brothers headbutting each other in the eyes. Another, who had lost both ears to frost, spoke with his face still down. Why stare at us so long? If you insist on knowing who these two are, the valley wherein Bazario's the, uh, stream begins its long descent, once was their father Albert's and their own, the, the Count of uh, Monogna, um, and that was his castle there. They issued from one body, and if you went all over um, Kaina, that this is the first region now, Kaina, uh, named after Cain, you would not find a shade worthier to be frozen in punishment. Not him, whose breast and shadow the impaling blade in Arthur's hand pierced Mordred when he killed when Arthur killed Mordred, pierced with one stroke. Nor him they called Frokisa. Um, uh, this Frokisa um, uh, murdered his own cousin in 1293. So you can see the re the repetition going on here. Nor this other, whose head so blocks me I can see no further. His name is Sasol Manchatori. Is one you recognize if you're Tuscan, and so you need not claim any more speech of me. My own name was Camison de Pazzi, and this is where I await Carlino's coming to make my sin seem less. less. Um, um, Carlino betrayed the white Guelphs in uh, 1302. Um, 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 Pazzi uh, uh, killed Ubertino, and they were kinsmen. I saw a thousand faces after that. All purple was a dog's lips from the frost. <laughs> Amazing simile. I mean, where does he get so many similes, right? The, the way dogs' lips when they're outside in the cold get purple. I still shiver and always will at the sight of a frozen pond. All through the time we progressed towards the core, where all gravity convenes, I quaked in that eternal chill. Now notice what Dante the poet is going to do here. Notice he even says it. From here on out, for the rest of my life, he said, after I saw this, and again, of course, all of this is a contrivance, we're not expected to believe from Dante the poet that he actually took this journey, right? We understand it's a, it's a construction. And yet, every time for the rest of our lives, when we see a frozen pond, we can imagine those heads sticking out and some of the stories that are going to come out of this um, 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 Cositis realm, right? And next, I don't know whether by ill, by will or fate or chance, Walking among the heads, I struck my foot hard in the face of one with violence that set him weeping. Okay, so he's gonna he's gonna uh, uh, walk into uh, this is this is Boca, all right, della um, Degali uh, Abati. Um, he was a Florentine Guelph. He helped the Ghibellines win at Monteperti in 1260, and for that, obviously, Dante is gonna have some nasty vitriol. Watch this one. Why trample me? He kicks him in the head. Why trample me? And if you not come to add more vengeance for Monteperti's defeat, then why do you molest me? I turned from him. Master, I said, I pray you, wait for me here while I resolve a doubt concerning his name. All right, and Monteperti is the Tuscan village that the Ghibellines, where the Ghibellines beat, uh, defeated the Guelphs in 1260, right? Go back to Canto 10 and lines 29 through 48 in our comments there. My leader stop. Don, uh, Virgil stops. And I addressed the shade who was still cursing as bitterly as before. Dante the Pilgrim. Note how he treats these prisoners down here in Cosidus so different from much of what he, we saw earlier, right? Or maybe similar to what we saw with Argente and some of the others. And who are you who reviles another, I said. Nay, who are you, he answered, who thus contrived to go through Anatorna and again, and and. And Torna is the, the, second re, the second realm here, right? Again, we're back to Iliad 3, 178, this Trojan warrior who supposedly betrayed Troy. It's not in, it's not in the Iliad as we saw. To go through Anatolia, striking the head and cheeks of others, which even were you alive, would be too much. Alive is what I am, I told him. And if fame is what you crave, then you might value having me note your name among the others. And I'll make you famous. Notice the further into hell we go, the less these people want to be in any way named or remembered. Their shame is too great. He answered, what I desire is quite the opposite. Get you gone and come to trouble me no more, inept as you are, not knowing how to flatter at this great death. Note the irony of flattering. We know what happens to flatterers in the afterlife, right? Um, then I reached out. Wow, watch what Dante does to this, to this, um, to this guy now, to Boca. 
Then I reached out and seized him by the hair and shook his scuff. Now, name yourself forthwith, or not a hair will remain. I threatened him. He answered, Though you pluck me bald in your wrath, I will not tell you nor show you who I am. Not if you fall a thousand times on my pate. In other words, I'm not telling you who I am. Already I had twisted round my palm a length of hair and pulled some clumps right out, and he was barking with his eyes held down when a new voice called, Boca, what is it that ails you? Are you so weary of the tune your jaws create that now you're barking too? What devil is at you? Now, said I, I am done. I have no further need to speak with you. He knows his name, right? A cursed traitor. He recognizes who he is. In other words, Dante the Guelph is always going to have a comment or two about anyone that would have helped the Ghibellines destroy the Guelphs, right? For now, to your disgrace, I will report about you what is true. Then go away, he answered. Tell what you choose, but don't be silent if you do get out about that one so quick just now to use his tongue. Uh, Busca the uh, um, Duera is a Ghibelline. He betrayed King Manifer of Naples, and so, you know, make sure you talk about him too. Here he laments the silver he got from Frenchman's hands. He's a traitor of a traitor. I saw him, you can declare, the man of Duria, down where the sinners are put to cool. And if they ask who else was there, the man of Bicaria is at your side, whose gullet was slit by Florence. He was beheaded in 1258. Also here, a little further along the way, reside uh, Gianni di Soldari. Um, uh, this, uh, again, is uh, these are all betrayers, okay? With Ganlian, you'll remember Ganlian from our study of uh, Song of Roland. He, 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 he uh, Jack saw, uh, tried to jack uh, Charlemagne. He was a betrayer. And uh, Tabulialdo, who opened Fanaze wide, opened the...